Well, um, let me comment on the term artificial general intelligence, which I don't like. It's an implicit criticism of artificial intelligence. Uh, the, some people felt, well, artificial intelligence isn't really going after broad human intelligence. Uh, it's going after narrow AI, recognizing speech and uh, playing chess or Go, uh, driving cars, and not uh, general intelligence. Uh, I actually think the road to human level intelligence is by uh, doing narrow applications at human levels and beyond. And those narrow applications are getting less and less narrow. I mean, six years ago, Watson uh, defeated the best humans in Jeopardy. It's not such a narrow task. I mean, Jeopardy involves all of human knowledge expressed in language, and it's filled with riddles and puns and metaphors and jokes. Uh, pretty subtle and sophisticated. It was actually quite impressive. And the ability of computers to actually respond to language has gotten even more sophisticated uh, in recent years. So computers are recognizing thousands of different categories of images. Five years ago, people were saying, ah, you guys can't even tell the difference between a dog and a cat, which was true. Now AI can tell the difference in a thousand other categories and do it better than humans. Uh, when uh, Deep Blue took the chess championship in 97, people said, yeah, well, that's interesting, but chess is just kind of a logical combinatorial game and computers are good at logic, and, but it'll never play Go, which the basic, uh, it's called Minimax algorithm where you work out every, the, the tree of every move, counter move, possibility doesn't work because there's too many possibilities. It can be over 100 moves at each half move, so the, the tree explodes and you can't use that, that method. You have to use deep uh, levels of pattern recognition to see subtle patterns on the board because you're trying to control territory, but that's a pretty vague concept. Uh, well, you know, just recently computers beat the best Go player in the world. And one uh, milestone after another has been reached. Uh, and that's the road to the artificial general intelligence, is these narrow applications are getting less and less narrow. So that's just a side comment on this term, artificial general intelligence. If you actually read the papers at the AGI conferences, they read very much like the papers at AI conferences. And um, as for ethics, it's a tough issue. We just had a, a Silomar conference on AI ethics called Beneficial AI in January, uh, which was patterned on the very successful Silomar conference on biotechnology ethics, which was 40 years ago. 40 years ago, some very, uh, I'd say, visionary thinkers saw the potential of biotechnology to transform medicine. And, to, and they realized there would be great promise. We ultimately could overcome every disease and aging process, but there could also be grave peril. The same technologies that we now use to reprogram biology away from cancer and away from heart disease could be used by a bioterrorist to reprogram a benign virus like a flu virus uh, to be deadly, uh, communicable, and stealthy. Neither of those, uh, neither the promise nor the peril was feasible 40 years ago, but they saw them both, and that they, they was quite visionary at the time. And they had a conference called the Asilomar Conference at the Asilomar Conference Center, which is run by the state of California. And they came up with ethical guidelines. And those have been re refined over the years. Many of them were baked into law. And as I mentioned, we are now seeing the promise realized of biotechnology, and it's still early, but that's going to be an explosion over the next decade. Uh, and so far, the number of people who have been harmed by abuse of biotechnology, either intentional or accidental, is zero. So that doesn't mean we can cross it off our list, okay, we took care of that one, because the technology keeps getting more sophisticated and we have to keep uh, revisiting that. But it's actually a very good paradigm uh, to have these ethical guidelines that practitioners follow. Uh, so we had a conference just uh, a couple months ago, uh, really patterned on that to develop ethical guidelines for, for artificial intelligence. Uh, 
And I think it was successful. I mean, time will tell if these ethical guidelines uh, will work completely. Uh, it's a little, it's actually more challenging with intelligence because intelligence is so general. You can develop certain technical uh, protections against abuse of biotechnology and even nanotechnology. Uh, you know, if something is more intelligent than you and is bent for your destruction, that's not a good situation to get into. You know, putting some little subroutine in your AIs is not going to be sufficient to, to keep them safe. That being said, uh, these guidelines on making sure you understand the mission of each AI, make sure that it carries out that mission and can't easily be adapted for other malevolent uses. I mean, these are good guidelines, but you can easily see how they can be circumvented. And a lot of these technologies are dual use technologies. Uh, the same intelligent uh, drone that's delivering medications to a hospital in Africa that doesn't have roads because the rainy season has washed them out, that's a good application. Those same drones could deliver a bomb uh, or, or you know, some other weapon. Uh, so keeping them safe is difficult. My, my uh, strategy for keeping AI at human levels uh, safe is to practice that in our human society. Because these AI futurist movies we've seen that are dystopian, uh, where it's the AI versus a brave band of humans for control of humanity, that's not very realistic because we don't have, I mean, look at today. We don't have one or two AIs in the world today. We have billions of them. And they're in our pockets and those devices are communicating with the cloud and it's very deeply interwoven with human civilization and with our own reality. We are already a hybrid of our biological intelligence with these brain extenders, which is what they are. Uh, even though they're not yet, for the most part, inside our bodies and brains, they're actually starting to do that, but you know, mostly they're outside, but they're still brain extenders. H how many people here or anywhere could do their jobs or get their education without these brain extenders? And they're deeply interwoven and very intimate and there's billions of them. And that actually, in my view, is the best strategy and reality for keeping them safe. Uh, but, you know, humans do get into conflicts. Now, I, I like to point out this is the most peaceful time in human history. And people say, what are you kidding? Did, didn't you listen to the news? Uh, you know, there was the event, uh, incident yesterday and the day before. And, well, our information about, our intelligent information about what's wrong with the world and the violence in the world is getting exponentially better. So there's some incident that's heart-wrenching, involves a small number of people halfway around the world. We not only hear about it, we experience it. And our empathy actually extends to small groups of people. We can't contemplate millions of people, but we can, you know, one family. Uh, and, but the reality is, and I think this is actually due to the exponential improvement of information technology, the world is more peaceful, it's more democratic, uh, you could count the number of democracies in the, in the world uh, a century ago on the fingers of one hand. You could count the number of democracies in the world two centuries ago on the fingers of one finger. Uh, we, not every country in the world is a perfect democracy, but democracy has become the consensus view as to the proper way to run human affairs. It is much more democratic. We now have dozens of you know, uh, pretty well-functioning democracies, and this communication, which is heart-wrenching, actually helps uh, keep uh, the world safe. Steven Pinker documents an exponential decline in violence. Your chance of being killed is hundreds of times less than it was centuries ago, and we had extreme scarcity of resources and very primitive methods of social communication and org organization. So, the the best, well, here's my strategy for keeping the world safe from artificial intelligence, which is to practice our, our better values, you know, democracy, liberty, compassion, uh, in the world today. The future world is not 
uh, which is Im imbued with AI, it already is to some extent, it's going to become much more so, that's not being delivered from Mars. I mean, that's going to emerge from this, the civilization we have today. If we practice uh, our human values in our society today, then our future society will also practice them because it's going to emerge from today's civilization. So that's my strategy. So what, what could go wrong? <laughs>